uh, what you call it, on our DX. And if it's no good, I'll put the old video from last year, which is pretty cute because Brian Kim, I don't know if you know that Brian, that student Brian Kim, um, was sitting back behind me making kind of a goofy face the whole time. So it's, it's entertaining to watch. All right, so as we remember, you need to tape down your paper before you start working, all right? And as you can see with me right here, the tape doesn't hold forever. That's how it is. It's not a big deal. It happens to all of you. If your painting is coming up, like both of my paintings were, um, then for sure, take the tape off. Don't try and like squeeze it back on. It never works. It holds for about three minutes. So don't try and don't try and tape it back on. Just take all the tape off and grab some new tape. Tape your paper down. This tape is rather curly. I don't know. Has anybody else found that? Like always, if I tear a piece longer than like a few centimeters, it always wraps around itself on me. So I'm very diligently running my tape. There we go. Ta -da. Now, while I'm doing this, I'm going to tell you something that I think is, is important. It's important to keep in mind. All right. Watercolor, like true watercolor, is translucent. That means you should be able to see the paper through it. All right. That's a characteristic of watercolor that you should use to your advantage. Um, and I'll show you a couple of reasons why. Crappy job there. Um, if you really want a like an opaque color, then I'll show you some other stuff. We have this stuff called gouache, which is like it used back in the olden days. Um, it was used by designers. So when you were designing a shoe or a, I don't know, a blender or something like that, you would draw it out on vellum and then paint it with gouache because the gouache would, would work quickly. It would dry opaque and it would dry flat so you wouldn't see the brush strokes in it. You know, if you wanted pink, you mixed pink in your palette and then, and then used it right, right onto your paper and you would only have to give it one coat and it would be one definite color, whichever color you mixed. We have gouache in the supply closet and I spent all of like 10 minutes yesterday looking and couldn't find it. Which I think means that the upperclassmen have that, which is their prerogative. They, they need it. But I did find poster color, which is like an inexpensive version of gouache. But it's pretty good. I haven't tested it out, so we'll see how it works today. All right. So I'm going to do three techniques today. I'm going to do a wash. I'm going to do some glazing. And I'm going to do dry brush. All right. So what you'll need is water. You'll need a brush. I like these like Asian brushes, right? These Chinese, Japanese, Korean brushes. Um, but any of the brushes that we have will work. I have moved the brushes, with the exception of the Asian ones, into the baskets that say small paint brushes, medium paint brushes, big paint brushes, and they should be accord sorted according to size. All right. Um, also, we're going to talk both about tubes and cakes. There's tubes, ooh, pretty cool, and there's cakes, as you know. We were looking at the cakes before. Does anybody remember, what are you supposed to do when you first open up the cakes? Wet water. Oh, you smart kids. Yeah, get it, get it wet before you, before you start working. Get it wet. So, I don't know, I'm going to go with some blue. I'm going to go with that kind of greenish blue because it's fun. And the... I have also found, you also need a palette. That's a palette. All right, this one is dirtier than I would like to have it. Really, like when they get done, and this one's disgusting. Oh, All right. The palette I so, 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 what you should do is make sure you clean them off really well um, at the end of class. And then that way, that one's okay, it'll work, but it's still kind of yucky. All right, I've also found having a scrap piece of paper test your colors out on before you begin is very helpful. You don't have to have it. All right, a wash. Dig this. First thing you do, put some water in your palette. 
All right? A wash is a very thin field of color. So you take some color from your cake, put it into the water. Ooh, if you want to mix colors, like if you don't want that color blue, if you want a lighter blue or a darker blue or something like that, um, you can mix it right in there. All right, and then you take and you load up your brush and you do a nice open area color like that. That's a wash. Ooh. Now mine's pretty thin actually, but that's all right, it'll work. One of the neat things is I got some sponges here. These are some um, smuggled in from the USA sponges. Uh, and you can also make a wash with a sponge. In fact, you can use the sponge to pick up color while you're working too. Now I think the, uh, watch, Ooh, isn't that fun? Yeah, there's a nice wash. <laughs> now, um, I, I always default and think when I do wash, I think sky. But it doesn't really have to be a sky. It can be any kind of like area of color. If you're working, like I'm looking at Sophia's snail there, right? And if you're thinking about the body of the snail, you know, you can use a wash to start the big body of the snail. Think when you're working with watercolor, at least if you want to be really traditional about it, think about first laying down blocks and areas of color and then slowly building the details on top of it, right? Of course, it works to outline everything and then tone everything in. That, that also works. But one of the neat things about watercolor is even when you paint outside the lines, it looks kind of cool, right? So use that to your advantage. That's all that sort of like... That's, that's the nice thing about the translucent part, type of the color. All right, so that is a wash. All right, now it takes a minute before I can show you glazing. We've got to let that dry a little bit. So I'm going to talk about sort of another form of wash. It's not really a wash. It's what we call wet on wet. And that's where your color, your, your paper is already wet. Now for this, hey, well, I'm excited about it. Um, I'm pulling out the tubes of color, which are pretty sweet. Now dig this. Look at that. They're all nice and well organized, all right? And they're all nice and clean and tidy and well taken care of. Please, we have more than just these two boxes, right? Please do your very best to keep, I should hold it in the camera so you can see, to keep the watercolors like this, even as we use them. Um, it has been my experience that when watercolors come out of the box and go into a basket of just all the watercolors, um, it gets really annoying to use. You're forever searching for that one blue that you need, and then this yellow breaks open, and it makes everything else stick to it, and then it just becomes a really gross mess, and nobody wants to use it anymore, and they go and open a new box. Always happens that way. So, so by all means, like use the boxes, but like use them with the idea in mind that these bo everybody's going to use these boxes in all these classes, so always put them away nicely, all right? So, so with the tube of watercolor, you can go about it, you can go about it different ways. I personally like to take color out of the tube first. So let's see, let's do red. All right, now you may find, this one isn't this way, it's already open, but you may find that a new tube of tu watercolor is going to be sealed. It'll be like a silver foil over the top of it. If that happens to you, all you do is you take the cap, there's a little pointy bit on the cap, see, pointy bit on the cap, and you stick that cap in there, and it'll open up the tube of watercolor for you. All right, so dig this. Take the watercolor. When it's brand new, it's sometimes like the gum and the water sits on the top, and it's all brown and yucky. Um, squeeze it out on your, on your board or on your scrap piece of paper first to make sure that doesn't happen. Or if it does happen, it happens on the board and not in your palette. You just need a tiny bit of watercolor. Squeeze just a tiny bit of watercolor on it. Immediately put the cap back on. All right, see, tiny bit. I can't hold it up because my blue will drip. All right, tiny bit. And then if you're doing a wash, do the same kind of thing. Add water to your palette. Let the watercolor run. Kind of spread it around a little bit. And there you go. Now you can add a wash. And the neat thing about it too is you can sometimes like add a little bit of extra color. Cool wash techniques involve, and this goes to that wet on wet I was telling you about, right? It involves kind of putting some color down, having the paper wet, 
and you can add, you can use water and you can use thick and thinner paint to, to create different, you know, like different variations in there. So I'm picking up some of that there. Ooh, pretty that neato. What's that? No, it's on. It's just the screen's okay. off. But thank you for letting me know. <coughs> Yay! That's a wash. All right, so glazing. All right, I'm going to try it here. Um, it worked on this paper pretty, pretty not bad. So like I said before, translucency is one of the cool characteristics of watercolor, right? And glazing is where you take layers of different colors on top of one another. To create, a, um, to create a third color, all right? So it works kind of like this. You have the white paper on the bottom, and you have a layer of color and another layer of color, and light comes through, and it goes through the layers of color and bounces off the paper, and as it comes back to you, those wavelengths shift, right? So you see a third color, or you see a variation of the color that you were just working. Um, I'm going to try it here. So I have blue right in here, and I'm going to get some yellow, See if we can make green without actually using green paint. And without mixing it in advance. I think that's kind of cool too. So I'll squeeze a little bit out. Mm -hmm. Let's see how it works. Is that wet? All right, and so we'll put a little bit of the yellow. Hey, dig that. Over the top of the blue. Isn't that neat? And that's a really, really basic way of going about it. I think one of the cool things about it is you can do layers and layers. Um, and if you're familiar with Renaissance oil painting, um, that's what those cats really got into, is layering these different, different colors and different tones of the colors so you stop seeing brush strokes and you stop seeing lines, like things just kind of evolved out of space. And that's how those Renaissance artists were able to get things to look so naturalistic, right? And so bright and grabbing, all right? Mm -hmm. So that's glazing. I did another one here the other day for the other class where... I had some really light pink on these flowers. You know, I just wanted to get the shape down, right? And then I went and got some peachy color over the top of it, and I wanted to kind of keep both the pink and the peach. I didn't go very far with it um, because I wanted to keep teaching. Um, but you can do that to also kind of use similar colors, like analogous colors, to create nice variation effects, right? Nice variety. Okay, last one, dry brush. Dry brush is not actually a dry brush, all right? Dry brush is when your brush is mostly dry. And instead of using a wash color like these, use the thicker paint, all right? So if it's with one of the cakes, you wait till it kind of, you know, kind of gets sticky in there and pick up some nice thick paint. Or if you're using the tubes, it's always nice to keep a little bit of that tube color solid in your palette. And yellow is a really terrible color to use for this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Actually, I hate that brush. We're not going to use it. Go back to this one. All right, so I picked up, I picked up some like heavy paint on the brush. See? See? No, see close. Aha, mean old Mr. Allen. And so dry brush is really effective when you want to outline something, when you want to make lines, when you want to define shape or define space or something like that. Um, I'm going to do a whole lot of nothing here. Right? And that's where you get that kind of more opaque color. I don't know what that is. A big yellow cloud. So with watercolor, like I said, the translucency, the neat thing about it, right, is that it is translucent. And that's one of the things it does well that other paints don't do well, right? That require more effort with other medias. Um, so use that to your advantage. With watercolor, kind of your, and this is the classic way, and I'm not saying you have to do this way. I'm just saying this is a way a lot of like 
watercolor purists approach it, right? They lay down fields of color with the wash, then they start to add variations in tones and shading by glazing, and then sometimes, but not always, they'll use dry brush to kind of outline the spaces. All right. Um, and that's like I said, I'm not saying that's the way you have to do it. I hope you're paying attention here, Ron. Yeah. Dry brush. All right, so I'm going to show you the poster paint, all right, and this, the gouache is just like this. It's just a bit higher class, although I've never opened these tubes, so I don't know if they're any good. We're going to find out. They're crummy for sure, but not in a bad way. All right, so you can use these like watercolor. They'll give you a, a translucent effect if you water them down a lot, but they're better used for creating flat, opaque areas of color. So get your brush wet, and you're almost kind of almost always dry brushing with this. All right, so I loaded up my brush, and I'm just going to get in some nice, solid area of color here. What? Hmm. Now. In theory, these also should dry flat, which means they kind of, they, they'll all dry the same kind of consistency. Really good for if you do like toning things, like drawing some lines around something and then painting in an area, like if I wanted this whole area to be blue. Right? Tone in an area like that. Now, I have also pulled out, there's colored ink. There's two baskets of colored ink now. Um, the, I brought the Chinese ink out. You know, that's a little thing in and of itself, but you're welcome to use it. The only trick is it's not waterproof on, on this kind of paper. So if you use Chinese ink and it dries and then you get it wet again, it runs. If you're ready for that, it'll freak you out. Um, and there's also the other black and the white ink over there, which you're welcome to use. Um, your goal today all right, is to think about what we've talked about with both the color wheel, you know, the mathematics, and some of the symbol things we've talked about, either the last class activity or the forbidden city activity or just looking at books, and make some small paintings, all right? Don't do anything big and elaborate. Don't be committed to anything like big and fantastic today. The goal for today is to have some fun with the watercolor and maybe explore some of those symbols that you've been looking at and explore some of those color schemes that you've been looking at. Okay? I'm going to take yes, silence boss. at... Yes, yes boss. boss. All right, Michael. Thank you very much. Okay, go ahead. Have a very good time painting things. What's up? I go to the bathroom. You may.